Welcome to Do It For The Gram and Enneagram podcast with your host, certified Enneagram coach, Milton Stewart, where we do it for the Enneagram, not Instagram. We make moves to improve our lives and those in our community. Today in this episode, we're actually shifting a little bit, talking about the defense mechanisms, but also how those defense mechanisms kind of connect to the anti-racism work that we are doing or we can do or we should do and the things that we should watch out for. This episode is amazing because I have an absolutely incredible person on here. I have an absolutely incredible person on here. I have Elizabeth on here to help really bring in a lot of the information on how do you actually work from a defense mechanism, working your way through not only that to be able to help other people, but actually going inside and being like, okay, what's going on here so that I can actually do the outer work to actually make a difference in our communities. And so she's done a whole lot of work. She has a lot of Enneagram information and knowledge. She's a Patreon supporter of Do It For The Grand podcast. I cannot tell you how amazing Elizabeth is and the knowledge that she has on this topic. I'm super excited to have her on here. Elizabeth, please introduce yourself. Hi, Milton. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I'm Elizabeth Worm. I am a life coach who I also offer Enneagram-infused training and coaching for my passion is um, specifically artists, um, actors and performers, directors, um, but really leaders um, of any type and also organizations. So um, I lead trainings, teach workshops, similar to the things Milton does. I'm really passionate about facilitating interactive discussions and using my improv background. So I have a bachelor's and master's in theater, believe it or not. And when I discovered the Enneagram, I ended up loving the Enneagram so much that I used it in my thesis in grad school. Um, And my thesis was on using the Enneagram as a tool for leadership in the arts. So how can leaders in the arts, like directors and producers, um, connect with the nine types of actors, for example? And then I've shifted that work to just leadership in general. How can leaders work with the nine types of people? So yeah, I love creating interactive experiences with my theater and improv (laughs) um, passion um, in my trainings. And my most recent workshop, I did an eight-week workshop using the research of Brene Brown and looking at how she has done research on shame and empathy and vulnerability and courage. And how do the nine types experience those, those things? So we'll get into some of um, that. And I'm really excited to be here on Do It For The Gram. So Elizabeth, I mean, there's not necessarily a litmus test um, Enneagram teachers, but in, in like professionals, but Elizabeth, she meets it if there is one. Uh, we we talked for the first time a couple of months ago and talking about impressive of someone's um, knowledge of the Enneagram, like really understanding the integrity behind it and the knowledge of it. I was blown away. Elizabeth doesn't know this yet because I just I'm just saying this now, but I was absolutely blown away. So Elizabeth is a beast of un- in understanding the Enneagram for sure. I just want you all to definitely know that. OK, so let's go intro music. So why are defense mechanisms like in the Enneagram so important for growth and especially anti-racism work? So one of the biggest things here that people have to understand when you talk about defense mechanisms, they are almost these unconscious or subconscious messages that we have somehow understood or we somehow try to affix to ourselves deep down inside. And so now we're acting from a place that we don't even understand. So when a situation happens that threatens our ego or threatens our personality, our Enneagram type, like there's a part of us that reacts in a way in order to defend what we believe ourselves to be or the value we perceive ourselves to have. So 
each type does it in a different way predominantly doesn't mean we don't have multiple defense mechanisms we use in our life, but we do different ones, um, different times, but we have one core one that we really stick to because we're really trying to protect our egos. And so this is very, very important to understand if you're talking about growing in the Enneagram, because when you don't see the defense mechanism happening, it is literally preventing your growth. You get to a point where you get kind of stuck in your growth path. Like you're, you made it somewhere. You're like, oh yeah, I've done some growth work. But in actuality, like after a while, you're just still in the same spot. And you're like, I don't know why I'm not growing. Well, a lot of times that's because maybe you have not recognized your defense mechanism within your type. And so that's very important. And so even if you're thinking about doing like true, like outer work along with your inner work, like we're talking about doing both here on Do It For The Ground. So if you're trying to do the outer work and you haven't identified what your defense mechanism, you're going to have a really hard time doing true outer work that is truly beneficial for those and come and comes from like a healthy, beneficial, loving place that is authentic version of you and the best version of you. And not necessarily like that uh, part of you that's like just trying to satisfy your ego. So that is like what is so important about the defense uh, mechanism and understanding which your defense mechanism actually is and what can you do about it? Okay. So Elizabeth, would you agree with that? Yeah. Um, I mean, to do effective outer work, we have to look at the inner work and also people who are really focused on doing the inner work. It doesn't really matter if you're not also doing the outer work, you have to have both. Yes. Thank you. You have to have both. That is, I'm not going to harp on it too long, but, um, that's a big deal, say the least. Um, <laughs> Elizabeth, let's jump into giving a very short and a brief, um, not maybe very short, but a brief version of the different uh, defense mechanisms for each type. So everyone kind of knows what each type like defense mechanism is. And we'll give a definition because we know the Enneagram language is not always the same language we use for that specific word. It's not the same connotation and denotation for the same word. So we're going to break it down a little bit for you as well. What number do you want to start with? Um, I like to start with eights and yeah. work our ways with sevens. <laughs> um, so, okay. So like Milton said, there are a lot of various defense mechanisms, but based off of our type, we kind of use one predominantly. Um, so eight. For eights, we chose denial. Denial would be just denying or forgetting anything unpleasant and just moving out of your awareness. Your awareness. So eights have so much energy and they're going and they're going, go and go and go. And so when something unpleasant comes up, um, something that might trigger their feeling center, something that makes them feel weak or vulnerable, possibility of getting betrayed. Nope, shut it down. Go, go, go. Now, again, we're talking about kind of in that autopilot, average to unhealthy space. That's kind of where I'm living with these stereotypical generalizations here. So there are going to be exceptions. But I'm saying eights, you um, just, I can see where you might be living in some denial um, because your focus is so forward. What's happening in the present? That might be something to look at. Yes, yes. Really, really, really good point. Um, when you talk about eights, the denial. And you, like you said, it's the unhealthy range a lot of times to healthy and the lower unhealthier range. And I notice when I see eights get into denial, they start to get bigger. They start to get stronger. They start to get a little bit louder, a little bit more. It's like, whoa, they, they move a little bit more from assertive to aggressive. You'd be like, oh, okay. Um, and so that is something to be aware of um, at times as well, because these defense mechanisms are strong. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for an example, like um, if an eight were to come into contact with someone who said, hey, you hurt me when you did this. The eight is likely going to have a really good logical thinking argument as to why they didn't hurt you. <laughs> um, and so that, is, as opposed to getting curious and wondering, um, tell me more about your, your perspective. You know, Tell me what I'm not seeing. The ego is going to come out and say, ooh, we don't want to look at ourselves inside and think, you know, maybe I, I was capable of hurting someone. Um, that's going to bring up a lot of shame, a lot of um, feeling um, that are unpleasant. And so that might be an example of, nope, denial. And you know what? Eights are really good at being clear, log logical thinkers. Um, they can use that for good. They can also use that <laughs> to undermine people and not listen to someone else's perspective. I've seen in elementary school, fifth grade, um, Fifth grader who's eight, she hurt a third grader girl feeling and she was like, 
I didn't do nothing but this. And I was like, but yeah, you, 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 you know, that hurt her. Like, come on. Like, but you know, I was like, it's okay. You know, we learn these things young, very young. Oh my goodness. All right. Nine, narcotization. Tell us about narcotization. So really distracting or checking out um, by engaging in some sort of familiar comforting routine. I've learned that comforting routines are really comfortable, for the <laughs> lack of a better word. Routines are really comfortable for nines. Um, that allows them to go through the motions and check out because nines are so passionate about keeping that inner and outer peace. Um, out away from conflict. I don't want to be around anything that's not harmonious. And I don't want to feel anything that is below or above the status quo. Um, so whether that's chilling on Netflix for way too long, or whether that, um, you know, binging and drugs, alcohol, food, you know, type of yeah. thing. Um, there could be, I mean, you know, overdoing it with sex, overdoing it with um, any any type of really anything can be turned into a vice. That's really using your it to comfort yourself and focus on that instead of what is actually going on. So a nine who someone maybe is coming to you saying like, "Hey, this this hurt me." <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, instead of where the eight might deny it, the nine um, is usually. At, on face value, pretty agreeable. And it's like, oh, okay. They'll, they'll kind of like agree with you. Um, <laughs> even though internally, they might not be agreeing with you. And then if they go home and think about it, they might not want to think about it. Um, they might just want to fall asleep to it. And so they're going to fa- distract themselves by checking out, um, not engaging with actually what, what actually is happening here. And so using... Whatever vice is comforting to them. Maybe it's just, you know, a comforting routine of, you know, doing your laundry and meal prepping. I mean, it doesn't have to be a bad routine for you, but it's nines are doing repressed. And what that means is they do all the things except for the thing that needs to be done. So one way they avoid doing the thing that needs to be done is by numbing and checking out and not engaging with the thing that needs to be done. And let me add that one of the the trickiest parts for the nine and doing their growth work and even noticing defense mechanisms, they can narcot they can narcotize themselves with the enneagram. Mm. That is the like that is one of the scariest parts because oh, no. they could be learning so much about it but not actually doing the work. But it's like I love this information. I'm learning about other people. I'm learning about myself more. You know, but it doesn't necessarily e- equate to doing inner work. You know, there's such a difference. And so they have to be careful. That's a really tricky spot that I see for some nines. It's like, I love, we can learn about everybody else, everything, learn about myself. But that does not equate, the knowledge does not equate to the actual work that needs to be done. So that's a tricky spot when you talk about narcotizing um, for nines, for sure. Just going down the rabbit hole of research. (laughs) I know fives can relate to that too, I'm sure. But yeah. Um, yeah, just, just anything that kind of distracts, numbs, helps you check out from doing the thing that actually needs to be done. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk about the one reaction Mm -hmm. formation. I I think a lot of people are confused about this one, but I also think I saw a post on Instagram and somebody had the defense mechanism for this one very wrong. And I didn't want to say anything because, you know, I'm being pleasant and respectful of everybody, but Mm -hmm. let's talk about reaction formation for the one. Okay. So (laughs) I, I'm not a one, but I felt pretty called out when I read about this. (laughs) Um, so the definition I would use is concealing an unacceptable emotion according to the one. Um, and instead reacting with maybe the opposite emotion to press it down or contradict it. For example, if we're talking about racism, Hey, Elizabeth, um, this thing that you did or said, it, it was problematic. It was harmful. It was racist. Oh my goodness. I cannot be racist. No, I can't be racist. No, you know what? I'm going to a Black Lives Matter protest. I ordered a sign for my yard. I'm hosting an anti-racism book club. I'm doing all of these things to prove to myself that I am not racist. And I'm like overdoing, overspending, donating to everybody, Right. Because I'm like, I don't want to look at the inner work (laughs) and, you know, I'm doing so much outer work and it is benefiting the community, but 
I'm not doing true inner work to really look at, okay, where, why was my comment harmful? Where was that coming? Where was that coming from? What part of white supremacy am I complicit in? And, and really looking at deep down. Um, and so reaction formation is basically like an overreaction and overdoing to kind of cover up the fact that I don't need to do any inner work. One example I can think of is in um, um, Little uh, little Fires Everywhere is Reese Witherspoon's character. Definitely like, a one. <laughs> yeah, she is the queen of reaction formation. So like, she's like, I can't, I can't look like I don't like black people. So I'm going to provide a job and I'm going to take care of, and I'm going to be an advocate. And, you know, she's just always doing things, but like Carrie Washington's character sees right through that and sees like, these are just actions that are coming from ego. These are ego actions that are protecting Reese Witherspoon's identity and not being genuine. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would say a lot of Reese Witherspoon's actions in there are reaction formation. Oh yeah. I think that's one of the trickiest part. And and remember everybody, this is more of an unconscious subconscious type of thing until you are able to see it. Mm -hmm. So for instance, when you talk about reaction formation, if you are a type one or even anyone that gets caught up in reaction formation, really think about it in your mind. It's like, I'm doing what's right or considered to be right. And so by your actions, you you really perceive that it's coming from a place that is like of true, authentic love or peace or making a change and making things right or better or improving them necessarily. But it's not. It's really not when it's reaction formation. It's coming from the ego structure and ego place. And we all know like these things have impacts and effects that last a little bit longer than just like what it looks like when we do them. There's an impact emotionally, there's an impact um, spiritually, there's an impact like emotionally that's different than when you're just doing something because people can feel the difference when you really mean it. You know, it's like if I were to um, make food for somebody and be like, I'm so glad I made food for you or I make food and just throw it on the table. Like I made food for you. What's wrong? But it's like, but you didn't do it the right way and you didn't care. So there's a big difference in here. Reaction formation, you have to be very careful. And it's really tricky for the ones because they're trying to be better. They're trying to be good, trying to do the right thing. And so in doing those quote unquote um, quotation marks, uh, good or right things, you end up in a space that sometimes is actually not connected to the true part of your heart in doing the work because you're actually trying to truly create a change, but in actuality, just trying to make yourself feel better about being good or right or better and stroking your ego. So you have to be careful. It's really tricky, really, really tricky. Does your workplace stink because the culture sucks? Are you tired of tolerating people and wish you could all work together cohesively? Does going to work give you instant anxiety? If you say yes to any one of these, you should probably quit your job. But since you aren't going to quit your job, you should call Kaizen Careers. At Kaizen Careers, we are all about improving personal and workplace performance. We use a unique tool called the Enneagram. The Enneagram helps individuals and organizations become more self-aware. That self-awareness lends into helping organizations with communication, leadership, and conflict management, ultimately turning self-awareness into self-mastery and creating healthy workplace performance so you can improve your services and bottom line. You can reach Kaizen Careers at kaizencareers.com or 901-334-1644. You know who is another one, um, Brene Brown? And mm. um, she hosted Austin Channing Brown on one of her podcast episodes, Unlocking Us. And they were talking about why, why do we like rules? And this is a quote from Brene. Um, she says, why do we want rules? Not so we can do the things the right way, but for our own protection have weapons for our defense. What that looks like is you can't call me racist because I did X, Y, and Z. And those are anti-racist actions. And Ooh. it's protecting me ah. because I followed the rules. You can't call me out. And that's why we say Enneagram is all about motivation. Yes. It's the motivation behind the behavior. It's not just the behavior. It's the motivation and, and looking at why we're doing what we're doing. Yes. All right, so let's drop down to the two. I feel like you understand this one really well. Let's talk about repression. Yeah, so I'm a type two. Um, yep, so repression. <laughs> it's so funny because I'm like, I don't do this. 
that's how unconscious these are. Yeah, yeah. Um, so repression is pushing down or hiding painful emotions um, in order to control them um, or not feel them. Right. So, you know, I'm a pretty emotional person. So at first glance, I'm like, I, I feel my emotions. I'm sad. You know, I get happy. Like, you know, I kind of live in sometimes a really melancholy, sad space when I go to kind of unhealthy sport. Yeah. Um, but what I've been learning in therapy, actually, is that I repress my anger. I don't typically tell people when I'm angry with them. And so I just kind of absorb it and then think we're all good until, you know, a year later when that all of a sudden comes out. <laughs> <laughs> and it's really vulnerable for me to to share with someone, hey, like, this made me really angry. Yeah. You did. So that um, is a defense mechanism. Um, so in with anti-racism work, if if I did something that was hurtful or harmful, I hate to think also that I hurt someone. Mm-hmm. Um, it could also look like, um, and that's where I think a little bit of my personal reaction formation comes in. I'm like, I don't want to deal with these painful feelings, so I'm going to overdo it, but I'm going to repress the actual feeling. So these yeah. defense mechanisms can work together too. Mm-hmm. What's really interesting is twos are one of the numbers that struggle with chronic illnesses. <laughs> I also have one. I have Crohn's disease and a lot of chronic pain. What's interesting is when I go in for therapy, um, like massage therapy, sometimes I can feel uh, the masseuse like pressing anger out of me. Ooh. Like, I've been noticing lately, like kind of around my collarbone, yeah. uh, my scalene muscles. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, like. I feel like this is like the anger section of my <laughs> of my body. I just I'm trying to get in touch with all this anger that I have repressed, um, and other likely other emotions that I have repressed. So I think twos we um, are feelers, and that triggers our doing center. So we feel someone else's pain. We feel you know someone comes to us and says, "Hey, you did this thing," and we're like, "Oh my gosh, I have to do something about it right away." Right. And we don't do the inner work first. We don't think through it first. We need to bring up a repressed center of thinking, um, think through some of the things first, and then what is mine to do, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to I'm going to do all the things that come to my mind. Right. So I see this in um, one of my mentees is a two. Mm-hmm. And you talk about like repressing anger, like it's a big deal. Like everything will be cool all of a sudden. And then like all of us, like something where it's really for him. He's, he, he's different. Like there's, you know, it's just different ways to work with different people. Mm -hmm. And he's really good at making you like him. And he's also really good at making it seem like it's not his fault. Like, oh my goodness. Like I, I really have to be like really focused in on him. Like, hold on, hold on, hold on. He's, he's changing the narrative. That's not it. No, no. Take responsibility. This is your fault, you know? Mm. Um, But the thing is, we have to get to, it has to get to a certain point to where he will be able to like admit like what he's really angry about. Like I really Mm -hmm. have to kind of press him and I'm trying to get him used to doing it by just asking him like, when we do talk, like what, like what's anger, what's making you angry in the last couple of days, you know, just to kind of help him to start to know how to release it and get used to it and be comfortable with doing it. Uh, because it'll have, it'll come to like a point where he'll get in trouble in school or something. And I have to like really press. And then all of a sudden, woof, now I've heard a whole new story of things that he never said before that he never discussed that we never just like, I had problems with this, nothing, but then it comes to that point and it's just coming out. And I'm like, yeah. I just need to hear this earlier so we can yeah. deal with it. You know? Right. So like that right. repression is so real. And I think, and I, and I always would think this because I think people are, misunderstand twos a whole lot. I really do. I, I think even the title, the helper confuses people so much about mm-hmm. the two. Um, and they only see like this one version stereotypically of a two and twos are way more complex than like the general description that people normally think of twos as. So mm-hmm. that's just a big part of it. Um, well, you know, so one's twos and sixes chain. So Suzanne Stabile was um, teaching me about that. And so chaining is <laughs> kind of like, I don't know if you ever made a, in elementary school, like a paper chain to count down for like a holiday. So you, you make a circle and then you make another circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Link them yeah, all. Yeah. You know, they're all like, that's mm-hmm. what I think of when I think of chaining. So twos, um, I've learned that I chain my anger. 
Mm -hmm. Um, but then I forget about it. So if someone makes me angry, then I absorb it. And I'm like, no, we're all good. Like the relationship's more important than my feelings. Right. Because that's pride working. Um, I'm, I, I, you know, the relationship is more important than my feelings. Like my feelings are, you know, we don't even talk about that. Um, <laughs> and so, um, but the next time the person makes me angry, it's like all of a sudden the chain comes back up and I'm like, oh, here's another one. Mm-hmm. And I link another one onto the chain. And I, I, <laughs> um, my therapist asked me once, like, um, to tell her about why I was mad at someone. And I was like, you know, I'm not, I'm not currently angry. So I can't remember why I'm mad. And um, it wasn't until that person made me mad again. (laughs) And the chain came up. And so um, that was one thought I had. The other, I had a question for you. How would you describe the difference between nines falling asleep to their anger? Because I'm Mm. I'm guessing a lot of nines might be able to deal with some, um, identify with some of this depression. How would you identify or differentiate between nines falling asleep to anger and twos falling at them, twos repressing. Is there a more engaged um, with the two versus the nine? It's less engaged. Yeah, I think you're. I think you're onto something because I have a thought about the last thing you said, by the way, as well. But um, going along with your question, I think I think a, a big part of the difference is that the way that um, it manifests itself. Like you said, mm-hmm. like with the two, it is. I think it's more a little bit more. Um, like it's a more of an inactive thing, but it is, um, they engage more because of it almost like in mm. a sense, like they find a way to engage the, like despite it happening. Mm-hmm. Whereas usually I would mm-hmm. say a, a nine usually kind of disengages, finds a way to disengage. So I, I that's how I would kind of compare the, the nine and the two, the, the difference between the way, what they do with that feeling of anger. Right. Um, for sure. Which yeah. is a really good connection, though, by the way, you just made. Yeah, really good because they do have quite a few similarities. But that core is very different, by the way. Mm-hmm. The core is very different. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think the thing I want to link to, what's interesting, you talked about uh, Suzanne Stabile calls it linking. I call it a scroll. Yeah. So when I'm teaching in like uh, companies, I call it a scroll as as in like when something happens, it's like it's like written down. You know what I'm saying? But they're not going to say anything mm-hmm. until a point comes where they do get frustrated and that scroll comes out. Mm-hmm. And it's like, mm-hmm. you remember back in 1996 <laughs> when I helped you change your tire, but you didn't even thank me or even give me food? I remember that. You remember that? Yeah. You remember that time? You didn't have nothing yeah. to drink, but I gave you some of my drink. You yeah. know, like, so I, I I call it like a like a scroll mm-hmm. uh, as I think of it. Uh, but that's mm-hmm. interesting. She calls it chain. I like that. I like that mm-hmm. too. Like that. Yeah, because with ones, twos, and sixes, um, we're repressed thinking. So right. there's, there's what, what that ends up doing with your chain or your scroll is, you know, this, like with sixes, um, this event that happened, this worst case scenario that happened, that brings up every other worst case scenario that actually happened and it yep. confirms it. And, and so you kind of bring up this chain or look at your scroll and, it, and you're not thinking through logically about, how, about the other times where it didn't happen. Right. Um, and the same thing with, with me and anger um, as a two, you know, I'm not looking at in context of all the relationship that we've had. I'm just looking at these things. It's like a confirmation bias. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm only looking at one. It's like a spotlight on this particular type of behavior. And I'm like, this happened before and it's going to happen again. And it just <laughs> keeps happening. And and then I go to eight space and get it. All right. So what about the three? Let's talk about the three. Let's talk about identification. So mm-hmm. what is identification? Mm -hmm. So threes are chameleons, um, you know, and they can shape shift into something people need or something people Mm -hmm. want. So, so threes are performers. They have this desire for approval and admiration and success uh, because deep down they fear that they're not worthy of love, connection, and belonging. And that if you really knew who they were deep down, that you would think they're a fraud. And so in order to, so you call a three out on something, threes actually really love constructive criticism. Mm -hmm. Um, They will eat that up because they're like, how can I get successful? Oh, (laughs) I need to do this. I will do that. I need to do this. I will do that. Like, and they, they will just take on all the feedback. They want all your feedback. Um, So it, so in, you know, you're, you're in an anti-racism discussion and you're, you're showing them, Hey, you know, this was problematic. They're like, Oh, boom. Thank you. Done. Like I will fix that. Because they're going to shapeshift 
into what you need them to be in order to be a successful anti-racist. Um, and so again, we're talking about behavior. Um, might look similar to like a one, That's right. right? Performing the action, yep. doing the action, as opposed to dealing with the inner work, um, dealing with what's actually going on inside. And here's the the interesting part about it. Like, like I was talking about earlier, when you don't do this work, it stops your growth, even though like externally you may seem like you're doing the right things. And that's what happens with a lot of, I would say, um, people who are famous, like they may seem like they're doing good things. And all of a sudden we find out they're doing all this stuff or they've done this. Well, it's because it's been going under the surface. That's the inner part the the real work that really needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Or this outer work looks good to people. And then all of a sudden you look in their relationship, you find out that it is like to shreds and they're not really good with their family and everything, but they've been great at this job and great at everything. Um, and that could be anybody, but especially for three, you have to be careful when we don't do the inner work and actually come from a place like from the inside of actually doing real work to actually do these things. Then we end up with like things like identification where we have merged to look outwardly, like mm -hmm. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I look successful. I look good. I'm doing it right. You know, I'm doing it well. Mm -hmm. But then it turns out it's like, oh, th that really wasn't doing it for them. I was doing it for me. Yeah. So Suzanne Stabile has a great five hour recording on um, Enneagram and recovery um, on her website. And so um, one of the stories she tells, cause she works a lot with the recovery community. And one of the stories she tells is, um, about how threes in the recovery community have to be careful. They need a sponsor who, who knows that they're a three. That's right. <laughs> because when they show up to the AA meeting or whatever anonymous meeting they show up to, they're going to be the most successful, reco like recovered person ever. And they often are leading the meetings by the second or third time around mm -hmm. because they've got it down. They've got those 12 steps. They're doing those steps, right? And so you need to be able to call a three on their bullshit and say, what's going on in your heart? What's going on in your feelings? Um, as opposed to, I get that you're doing, you're, you're capable of doing, but we need to lay down the doing for a second and look at the feeling. Oh yeah, that's some real deep stuff. Um, I have a really good friend who's a three and he appreciates me because I see through it. He allows me to hold him accountable. Yeah. Um, and he wants real constructive feedback from me, but then he also trusts me because I can. Yeah, so great. that is a, Huge thing you're talking about there, four threes. Yeah. Mm, really tough. All right, fours. So fours, introjection. This is a very That's interesting one, a word we rarely <laughs> ever use. So what is introjection? So I'm going to skip forward just for a second and say, we'll compare this in a minute to sixes projection. There you go. So um, there's projection and then there's introjection. So fours, instead of projecting onto other people, they will absorb or internalize or inflict pain onto themselves instead of responding productively to criticism or rejection from others. Mm -hmm. So you criticize a four, you provide them some constructive feedback. You say, hey, this, this is not helpful. This was problematic. And they're like, you're right. And then they just withdraw into their deep, dark hole. They are experiencing a, sh a shame spiral with the... Uh, you're not good enough. Who do you think you are? Fours are also doing oppressed. Doing is really vulnerable for fours because they don't have a lot of self confidence because doing comes with self doing comes with confidence. Um, if you don't know, you don't know you can do something until you've done it. And so before you've ever done it, you don't have the confidence to know that you can do it. It's kind of like this loop. So you kind of have to put yourself out there. That's vulnerability for fours. And so when fours finally do something. <laughs> that they really have thought through and they've thought through all the feelings and thought, and then they get feedback that it wasn't good. Right. <laughs> then that reinforces this, this shame that you're not good enough. You know, who, who do you think you are? All of those things are shame <clears throat> voices. Um, and they will get stuck in that deep, dark basement. Um, I had a four one time <laughs> tell me that going into the basement, it's like you open up the, the basement door, like those old fashioned, like ground basement doors and you just keep opening up more basement doors. You just keep going down this basement door and just opening up more basements. And so you're kind of sitting down in this deep, dark well, absorbing, internalizing, inflicting pain onto yourself, um, where, you know, as which is so different from how the three would respond, right? The three oh, yeah. is all outer work. Okay, yes, I'm doing all the things and they're not even focusing on what's in, happening inside the four is like flipped. They, they're like, oh man, they feel that so much. 
they just feel the pain. They're lamenting about the thing that they did. Um, they can turn into a victim and it sometimes um, mm-hmm. and and victimize themselves in that process. So watch out for that. But um, but the feeling the pain so much prevents them from actually engaging again, putting themselves out there again, doing the work. So they said the wrong thing. Okay, so now four is never going to say anything ever again because of that shame spiral. That sucked so bad and they mm-hmm. got no good feedback. So I'm not confident that I can ever do anything right ever again. Um, so feeling the feelings is part of the work, but don't get stuck there. Right. Um, don't inflict more pain on yourself than you need to. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I mean, you know, we talk about, especially in this work, like, being uncomfortable, developing the capacity to be uncomfortable. Fours yeah. have that capacity. Yeah, that's easy. Uh, yeah, for them, <laughs> right? That, that is not the work. Fours have to move through the uncomfortableness and then keep going. Even if it's not right every single time, keep doing the work, keep showing up, keep being vulnerable. That's the work that fours uh, need to engage with. Yeah, and what I and what I'll add because um, this one is really interesting when you talk about interjection. I I see fours having this happen a lot in their relationships that go wrong, and I mean, like they literally they'll have a breakup and they will attribute all of the things that happened bad in a relationship to themselves. Mm. When in a relationship, it's a two par party. Like yeah. both play, both people play a role in what's going on in that relationship. So I see that happen a lot in the relationships that fours have. And then when you talk about the loop, and I, I'm just thinking about, I just thought about the different subtypes of the four. It's mm-hmm. it's interesting with the interjection um, with the different ones because like self prayers for usually will take it all in, like definitely take it all in and not show it all. They right. may even be, they may even seem sunny on the outside, happy, like, oh, this person's happy. And they're just yeah. really beating themselves up really, really bad. And you really don't know what's happening to them. And then you have the uh, social uh, for, which is literally expounding and ex- expressing to everyone, like how much I am suffering, you know, letting <laughs> everybody know, you know, that they're outwardly interjecting <laughs> all of the information, mm-hmm. letting people know this is what's going on, you know, really going on with them. And then the subtype of the sexual um, four is the one I get a little worried about with interjection because it's like I'm suffering. I'm really mad at myself. But somehow, sometimes it turns into an extreme reaction to the Mm -hmm. people, to people outwardly or to themselves. So they have to really be careful in this Mm -hmm. moment. So when you talk about like actually going through like being able to go through the pain, the uncomfortability to get to the other side so you can really think and process, Okay, like, all right. What's yours and what's actually mine? Because some of this stuff is not all my issues and my suffering. Like I'm taking on stuff that's not my own. I can give that back to whoever else belongs, but it's yeah. not mine. So yeah. that is extremely important uh, for force to be able to do when you talk about introjection. Oh my goodness. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you don't have to take that on. That's not yours. Leave it yeah. to somebody else. Mm-mm. Yeah. That's their stuff. But like you said about the sexual force, when you're giving that pain back, <laughs> make sure you're doing it in a, with the right motivation. Yes. Um, because otherwise, like you said, it can be an extreme reaction and it's like, I'm suffering, so now you need to suffer too. Yeah. That creates another cycle of it the does. same thing. It's like, oh exactly. my goodness, I did it again. Right. So taking ownership of the things that are yours and then holding people accountable. Brene has d- does great teaching on blame versus holding people accountable. Um, blaming and shaming versus accountability. Blaming and shaming is a reactive process. It happens yeah. instantaneously. Whereas holding somebody accountable is, is a longer process. And it includes asking questions and having a conversation and really understanding someone's motivation as opposed to just, boom, this is this is what you did. So um, yeah. So I love that you brought up the, the subtypes there because Every every four is going to interject differently, just like all of the types are going to do True. their defense mechanisms differently. But I love hearing that that distinction, especially the four. I just think about it because you know, like emotions, like they're so in touch with their emotions and they can be quick to respond to them before really processing them, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to get that out there, especially for the fours. All right. So let's jump into the fives. Five. Mm-hmm. Isolation. Let's talk about isolation. Hi, I'm super excited to tell you about a partnership I just joined in on. 
As an Enneagram coach, I understand the Enneagram helps in all different aspects of a person's life. A part of that journey can only be helped sometimes by someone outside of themselves, someone in the profession of counseling or therapy. So that's why I partner with BetterHelp.com. BetterHelp is basically a virtual way to contact and be in connection with counselors and therapists around the country. And at this time that we're going through socially being distant and a lot of being trapped in our houses or different things, even though it can be wonderful, a lot of times we may need to express something that's going on or things may be arising inside that we don't understand how to deal with. And so BetterHelp is a wonderful, affordable way to receive therapy and counseling in your home virtually. So if you are struggling, BetterHelp can help. You'll receive 10% off your first month when you sign on using betterhelp.com forward slash do it. That's D-O-I-T. So this information will be in the show notes, but this is a way if you do need some help, mental help and working through things and emotional things, BetterHelp can definitely help. Yeah, so fives, you know, fives get the reputation of being cold and calculated. I don't think that's true for all fives. I know some really empathetic fives. However, I've heard fives tell me when they're in pain, when they experience some pain, whether it's because of something they've done or whether it's just because someone else is suffering, they, it, it's like, it's this really intense, they feel it very intensely inside, but they don't externalize it. And they can't be around other people while they're experiencing that pain. So they distance and retreat away from what is bringing the pain. Um, I was talking to a five who's a little bit older and he was telling me about when his mom was dying in the hospital and he couldn't even bring himself to go visit her mm. because it was so painful. So he stayed away. And it wasn't that he wasn't feeling the pain because that's kind of what, you know, I would assume if, if it was me in the hospital and you're staying away. Um, but it's his pain was so much that he couldn't bring himself to engage. So the isolation I still are feeling the pain, but they prefer to feel it in isolation. So it takes courage to, to engage, similar to the, to the nine or the four. Um, courage to engage and stay, don't detach from the pain because um, that's something fives can also do. You know, you don't have to process your pain with a whole group of people, fives. <laughs> you know, you can pick one trusted person to, to share that pain, um, to find that, that trust and that accountability so that you can move forward and, and, and fix or do or reconcile, um, or just be there. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And this is why it's very tricky for, um, fives when we talk about this being a defense mechanism, because a natural state of the five, a lot of times likes to be a little bit away from people so they can really process and think and know what's going on. And so this is the very, very tricky part. It's like, are you actually, you know, being like retreating in a, in a sense of like going to be by yourself to like process your thoughts, you're in a healthy space, you're good. Or are you actually isolating yourself? You know, like what, what like noticing the difference between those is huge because yeah. That's a scary and tricky part for fives. Like you said, if they're already have created, because, you know, fives control situations by like, people don't understand, fives are actually very controlling. They control situations by making sure you, like, you know how close and not you can come to them or when you can and cannot speak to them. That's kind of how they do control. It's very interesting. So when we talk about them isolating themselves, you have to be careful because people could think that's just a regular part of the routine. You know, when actuality, they're dealing with some hard pressing issues that they it's just so much for them to have to like um, process in their bodies and feel in their bodies. And so uh, that is definitely uh, something that people who do love people who are fives to make sure try to be in their lives and ask good questions to figure out if something is going on. Mm -hmm. But also for fives to make sure you understand that isolation is not good for you. We all need other people to process things. You yeah. do need your special time alone. We all know that. Like if you know the Enneagram, you know fives need their specific time alone to really just mm -hmm. be by themselves. And that's yeah. what they, it's part of their like health. But you have to notice like, am I isolating myself? Which is different. There's a different feeling. There's different things going on in your body and being able to make sure like if you are isolating, you realize it, then it's time to reach out to someone that, you know, you love and trust, or you know, love and trust you, you know, who you can give at least a piece of, you don't always have to give all of it, but just a little piece of it, because we all need that connection with people. Yeah. Healing happens in community. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I've been learning. And, um, fives will suffer in silence by themselves. 
um, because they want to be self-sufficient. They don't want to bother other people. They don't want to be a burden to other people. So they, they will suffer in silence, but healing happens in community. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. All right. So the, the number you fast forwarded to, six. Yes. let's talk yeah. about projection. Projection instead <laughs> of putting it inside yourself is unconsciously attributing these unwanted or unacceptable thoughts. Yes. To others. So, um, if I'm feeling insecure, I might project that insecurity onto the person that I'm talking to. I don't want to deal with these thoughts or feelings. And so that must be what you are feeling or thinking. I've had a close working relationship with a six and, um, I I can't quite, I couldn't quite ever tell (laughs) when she was calling me out for something I was doing (laughs) or, if she was calling herself out for something she was doing. <laughs> Still working through that because as a two, I'm like, sure, of course I'm doing that. And then I like, I'm like, you know, trying to overdo and, you know, please her. But then maybe some of it wasn't actually mine mm. to deal with. So um, I don't know. What what are your thoughts on, on this? I see this quite a bit. And I, and I feel like when six, when sixes are really doing their work uh, and they notice projection, like when it comes to like their attention and awareness that they project, it's like the ground beneath you just like moved and shifted. Like it, mm-hmm. it like it just broke apart because a lot of their processes and trusting their thoughts, mm-hmm. even though they like distrust their own thoughts at times, mm-hmm. trusting their thoughts and, and like the fear or something they may have is so like natural to them. So they feel like it's so like yeah, that's that's the thing. Like, that's right. That person was like that. This situation was like that. But when they start to realize projection is like a real thing that they do to I found that it's kind of scary for sixes when they first find out, you know, when they when they be like, oh, wow, I do project. Oh, my goodness. It really transformed the way that they um, operate with people and themselves because they're like, oh, man, is this mine? Is this your, like, am I do I feel that way? So I see that quite a bit. Um with sixes, especially projecting fear, or you might be doing something, or you all may feel this way, because I've worked under a six before. That's one of the things that happens. It was like, you all probably feel this way. And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're, we're good. Like, you good? Like, that lets me know that it's not coming from me. It's coming from within them. And yeah. they're trying to be like, you all need to be okay. So I'm going to do this. Like, no, bro, we're good. We're good over here. Oh, man, I wish I would have known that a few years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Trust me. Um, this has helped me immensely uh, work with people. Yeah. How does a six move move forward from, you know, realizing, okay, I might be projecting. So then what does that look like? Yeah. So as you and I both know, uh, sixes are thinking repressed, which is mm-hmm. interesting because they are in the thinking center. So I would say one of the things when they they start to realize that they're projecting things it's really to whatever they're projecting once they start to realize it it's like okay why do i feel that way or am i thinking this way so now Mm -hmm. it's time for them to really um they're good at analysis but really analyze those specific things that they're projecting because a lot of times those are the things that sometimes they may be projecting anger on other people or something on authority or just a a different position than somebody else but it's because something inside has an issue with that you know or Mm -hmm. or something inside is very similar to that so Mm -hmm. now it's projecting it because like I, i cannot be like that that's not part of my ego so i would say figuring out what what the things that they do project when it happens because you get like the more you start to notice it, you get better at doing it. You get better at right. noticing it. And we're going to talk about that in the seven in a second. When you start to notice it more and more, it's like, all right, so why am I? So what what am I? It's just like, what? What am I projecting? And then why am I projecting it? Getting in touch with some feelings of yes, really looking at the fear. It's usually a feeling that's like kind of being projected. It's maybe a, it's, it's coming from the headspace, but it's really yeah. a feeling that they're projecting on like mm-hmm. a situation, a group, somebody else. I like how you said the feeling is coming from their head. So getting in touch with their heart <laughs> might help. Even though they're not feeling repressed, um, their feeling sometimes is disconnected from their thinking. Yep. Makes sense. Where some people feel, they, they think through their emotions. Yeah. Sixes can em- on, emote through thinking almost in a sense. I, I don't think I worded that just correctly, but I think people understand what I'm saying. Like, yeah, I feel my thoughts. You know, I'm in the feeling, I'm in feeling triad. So I feel my thoughts. 
Um, six is probably think okay. through their feelings and then decide what's helpful to feel or not. There's a level there, depending. All right. Let's talk about seven rationalization. What is that? <laughs> Your face is great. <laughs> um, sevens have this ability. It's really an amazing ability to reframe any situation into a positive. Can be a good thing can also work against you, especially when you're trying to justify something negative or harmful behavior, um, problematic behavior. And so reframing it, showing the reasons why you did what you did. I've logically thought through this. And so here's why I did what I did. It's coming from a very logical place. Sevens, again, are in the thinking triad. They can think very logically. Um, And sevens live in the happy half of range of emotions. It's hard for them to dip into the negative half of emotions because when they're in that negative half of emotions, it's like, how long is this pain going to last? I don't know how long this pain will last. And sevens have this unconscious fear that they will not be satisfied and that their needs are not going to be met. And so they have to go meet them themselves. And they, they go do that through a lot of fun, (laughs) fun, frenetic activity and doing a lot of really great um, work. Um, But so that's why when you are trying to bring up something more difficult with a seven, they don't know how long this this painful conversation is going to last. And so personally, for anyone who's working with the seven, um, who's doing their work, you know, it might be helpful to be like, hey, can we talk about this for 10 minutes? (laughs) Um, You know, to help them kind of See that, you know, this, this painful feeling is not going to last forever and that there is hope, there is good that is going to come from having this conversation. Similar to how nines avoid conflict, sometimes engaging in the conflict will actually bring the relationship closer together. Mm-hmm. And I think sevens can um, relate to that in, in some ways. Yeah, uh, most definitely. Uh, I agree with everything you said. I didn't realize... Like before I did um, Dr. Ginger Lapid, Lapid Bagda's um, class, uh, Enneagram coaching and certification, mm-hmm. before I did that, I really didn't fully understand rationalization because it was such a part of who I was. I was like, how's that a defense? Um, she had us do an activity where I was sitting behind, like it was me and another seven. And we were sitting behind a lady who was a three and she had like a business issue or something. And uh Dr. Ginger, I call it Ginger. Ginger, she said, okay. She said, I want you to give the issue you have and the sevens behind you. I want you to come up with anything that pops in your mind of like the reasons why she, you know, can't do it, can do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And she mentioned the problem. I'm telling you, we spit out probably 15 different (laughs) reasons why she can and will do like and create her business, which she ended up doing, by the way. Uh, She's she's a great entrepreneur right now, doing wonderful things, right? But Great Enneagram coach out there. But here's the thing. It's just like, it was so automatic. And then she switched it up and she gave us a scenario. She said uh, there was a, um, and not to give away anything Ginger's doing, but she said, she basically set it up in a way that she mentioned a bad situation Mm -hmm. and she wanted us, she said, as soon as I mention it, come up with reasons why, like, and rationalize it. Oh my goodness. It was so easy. And people were like, oh, and I was like, y'all can't do that, you know? But I didn't realize that that what was happening. So this is how I realized, like, once we did that, I was like, oh, that's what it is. So I I was kind of like, okay, I guess I understand it now. So later on in that conference, this is like a five, six day conference, like training. Mm -hmm. I moved hotels and I moved to a hostel because I was trying to save money. And I was like, okay, cool. It's like a decent hostel with the pictures, you know. I got my stuff. I'll be safe. I'll be all right. It's right. Walking distance, right? I am too bougie self-pressed seven to stay in a hostel at that one anyway i walked in the room smelled like bathroom there was already a guy on this bottom bunk laying there which is really awkward for me anyway i was like who is this guy i slept with my like with my um it's bunk beds by the way and i'm a six foot two guy i don't fit in bunk beds real well (laughs) so i slept with my luggage uh-huh. in my bunk bed with me because it was too big to lock up in this little lockers thing. And I press, I don't trust anybody coming in late anyway, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The window's super thin. I can hear everything outside. People mm-hmm. cursing, throwing beer bottles, police mm-hmm. sirens, everything, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I'm self praying so I don't trust nobody. So I'm not really sleeping, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I wake up in the morning, go to breakfast, and some, I had my bagel there. And this guy, like, 
dripped water from his hands on my bagel, reaching over me to get something. I cannot tell you how mad I was when that <laughs> happened. I was like, I'm done. I'm not eating this. Like, I'm not even eating in here. I won't even none of you people, none of you people. So mm-hmm. I walk out and I'm like walking towards the um, the building where we're doing training. And in my head, I'm like, it's not bad. I'm saving money. I'm doing well. It's all good. I'm okay. I'm out. And I said, I stopped. I said, oh my gosh, that's it. I'm rationalizing. I'm mm-hmm. pretending like everything was okay in that situation. And I literally hated everything about it. I said, Milton, turn around, go get your stuff. And you're going to find somewhere else to stay for the next two nights. And yeah. I did. I went back yeah. to the hospital. Gra- I said, I'm going to need to check out. And I'm not, this is not suitable for me to be able to stay here and everything. So I got my stuff, went there and ended up staying with like a great person who was from the Enneagram training. Um, mm-hmm. People are great at Enneagram trainings, by the way. For oh, the most yeah. part. oh my great goodness. People. Like I have so yeah. many places to stay just because they met me through. It's so good. But mm-hmm. I say that because rationalization, it literally made me think that like it just turned everything into being okay. Like, it's okay. Like it's it's fine. And I was like, yeah. Milton, it's not fine it's at fine. all. Not even a little bit. And so that's part of the way rationalization works. It's so like all of these defense mechanisms are so unconscious because we've been doing it for so long. Mm-hmm. It just feels like a part mm-hmm. of us. Uh, but when you catch it and you start to catch it more often, you're like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. You really can start to move past it and move into more of some deeper growth work for mm-hmm. sure. So it's, it's very opposite of sixes who can automatically generate worst case scenarios. And so I'm curious if uh, if you were given the exercise of, can you tell me everything that might go wrong in this situation? Would that be hard for you? I, I think it definitely would be hard for me, um, especially now. I mean, like, I mean, especially I would say two, two to three years ago, it would definitely be super hard. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say as I've grown and I've like actually been able to create uh, more worst case scenarios, I'm like, yeah. And like the self pres part of me, like I would say maybe for a social and a sexual seven, it'd be even harder. But mm-hmm. the self pres part of me thinks about like some dark stuff quite a bit. I think just I th- physical safety and survival. Oh, yeah. my goodness. I yeah. think um, Dr. David Daniels said someone said this and I'm not giving the quote to the right person, probably. But they said, if you want to see a truly pessimistic person scratch a seven. I Ooh. said, dang, ouch. Oh, oh, I was like, okay, let me cover up these scratches. I guess. It's fine. I didn't get scratched. It's fine. Um, so that was some yeah. deep stuff. I'm just curious. Do you have a more of a six wing or an eight wing or do you know? So growing up, it was definitely more eight wing to be strong, to be protective. Black culture is typically more eight trying to, you know, Mm -hmm. make sure we're strong and not show vulnerability or weakness. As I've grown up, I've really realized that I've been more balanced than anything. The six wing has actually engaged the eight wing more often because Mm -hmm. of, and I would say the lower sides growing up, I would Mm -hmm. say like the the fear of certain things that could happen or probably could happen, make me want to like armor up and be extra tough in front of places and people and Mm -hmm. stuff, you know, whereas it's like, "Mm, I don't know. And whereas now I am moving more towards even the six wing and just being more prepared when I do different things or taking more time, being a little bit more organized, um, thinking through contingencies a little bit more. I would say, you know, it's, it's kind of a balance of both for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I would say all the way through, but one motivated the other one. I find it just interesting how the defense mechanisms kind of, I don't know, I haven't done any work on this, but like, you know, the threes and the fours, like mm-hmm. it's like completely different, right? And the sixes right. and the sevens, like it's so different, you know, like just the off, like numbers can be right next door to each other, but have a polar opposite reaction, the, the one next door. And, um, and then it's also interesting if you have a wing that's, you know, one of the numbers next door, how does that infuse, you know, do you, do you take on some defense mechanisms from the numbers next door? I think I definitely do. I can yeah. share the reaction formation and identification of the one and the three for sure. I definitely agree. I mean, Like rationalization and denial go hand in hand for when I think about my past and like different. Oh, please. Hand in hand. Oh, my goodness. Um, So I definitely think the numbers are the numbers right beside us. We can um, get a little bit of those. So I think uh, even introjection for the three can pop Mm -hmm. in every once in a while. We just won't know it because externally they won't show it a lot of times Mm -hmm. unless you really know them. So I definitely agree with you on that one. We pick up a little bit of that some of that wing action, um, defense mechanisms more than we think we do. Oh my, oh my, oh my.